Ah, science! Okay, D-Man, so science is weak. Actually, the first topic we're going to talk about was sent to us by a fan of the show. Oh, shit. Again, follow us on social media. Let us, you know, you can interact with us, and sometimes I'll listen to what you say, and it'll it'll end up on the show. Jeff will listen to you. <laughs> this was sent in by Harley David Jr., and it was a topic that I had never heard about before. It's called... The Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA. It's a heavily modified Boeing 747 special performance jetliner. And it's got 17-ton, 8-foot telescope mounted behind a 16-by-23-foot sliding door that reveals the infrared telescope to the skies. Isn't that crazy? That's So it's... It's 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 they're not looking at us. They're looking at the they're stars. looking at the stars. OK, that's good. And um, it's incredible. The plane's ability to fly near the edges of the atmosphere gives it better visibility than ground based observatories. And the fact that it makes regular appearances on Earth's surface, unlike a space telescope, means it can be easily repaired or reprogrammed. So it's the best of both worlds. We're so above it's like, the atmosphere, yep, yep. but it can come back down and we can repair it. Because remember when Hubble broke and it was yeah. so hard to go up there and fix yeah. Hubble? So it's like, a mix between a telescope on on Earth, on the ground, and a satellite. Yeah. No, I never even thought of that. Is that I, I mean, obviously, it's not difficult to get pictures while while on a moving vehicle right. because we do it on telescopes all the time. All the time. Hmm. Um, and this just allows us to, to, to utilize this in a completely new way. And as you can see with this graph, it's looking at everything, planets, comets, you know, and it has this infrared technology, which gives us a little bit more of an insight of looking at something that a normal telescope might not be able to do. I actually have a side-by-side um, a -side comparison right here. This is literally the visible light of Orion on the on the left there and then that's the infrared from Sophia of Orion and that just gives us more data that's fantastic looking fantastic and I have um, a short clip from a longer video from NASA that explains a little bit more about Sophia and shows you the interior of this incredible flying observatory and check this out <laughs> think of Sophia mostly as sort of catching light. Day after day, we can get up and do these missions and really do really cutting edge uh, astronomy in the infrared spectrum. SOFIA is an observatory, and like other observatories around the world, it can do a lot of different science. A lot of those observatories are on the tops of mountains, around 13 or 14,000 feet. Even when we have a ground-based telescope in a perfect place, sometimes it doesn't get any data because the clouds come in. Um, being able to fly over all of that is just a tremendous asset. What happens is in the upper atmosphere of the Earth, as the light comes down you know, from some astronomical object, uh, very little of that light is able to pass all the way down to the ground. So what SOFIA does is it flies above the bulk of that water in the atmosphere. The SOFIA can fly at 43,000 feet, more than double the height of all of the other observatories in the world. And that is above 90% of the water vapor, and that's a position that is necessary for astronomers to do infrared astronomy. Space-based observatories have some really unique aspects to them. They're always in space, they're very cold, they can observe around the clock day in and day out. The spacecraft that the demand on low weight, low power consumption are very extreme. So in an airborne observatory you have a lot of power, a lot of space available. One of the powerful benefits that SOFIA brings us is the ability to go chasing these occultations in a way that no other observatory can do. 
An occultation is basically a situation where a planet or an object of interest moves in front of a background star. We uh, observed uh, a Pluto occultation. So that was where Pluto fell in our line of sight with a background star and made that star's light blink out very momentarily. They modeled where that shadow was going to be and we flew this airplane at roughly 500 miles an hour to catch a shadow that was going across the surface of the Earth at 53,000 miles an hour. So Sophia is considered to be an international resource to be used by the global community of astronomers. We hope to truly inspire students, scientists, engineers, mechanics, pilots, so anyone in a great school classroom right now, depending on what their interest is, they can see themselves operating Sophia in the next 10 to 15 years. There are a lot of open science questions that have been open for, quite frankly, a very long time. Creativity and inquiry is what's going to lead Sophia to discovery and to answering a lot of outstanding questions over the next 20 years of its life. So that's really, really interesting. The, this plane, Sophia, can stay airborne for over 12 hours, and its range is 6,625 nautical miles. And with a surface ceiling of 45,000 feet in the air, it can fly above the troposphere, which literally gets it above 99% of the water vapor in the atmosphere. And that's wow. literally what's taking our resolution down that from ground-based telescopes. That makes sense. Because we're having to fight through all of that just yeah, to get yeah. these, these pictures. Wow. It can get above all of that, which is crazy. NASA says the data provided by Sophia cannot be obtained by any other astronomical facility on ground or in space. And unlike grounded um, telescopes and satellites fixed in orbit, Sophia is mobile so it can better spot transient space events like supernovae or comets. Now remember, transient stuff is like what Tess is looking for with those planets. It's when light passes in front of a an object right, right, and you can see it so it's like, oh, there's something there. And because this thing can move around, we can actually track that stuff way easier. You know, I, I have some other examples here of, of, of what it's doing and like wow. these are some pictures that it took um, of Orion, again, of the Orion area. And then you can see, like, the visible light is all the way on the left. The near infrared is the center one, but Sophia is taking that mid infrared on the end. Wow. And that's giving us just a better idea. And it's not just one thing. We're using all three of those types of telescopes, and we're getting the full picture now, which is really cool. Wow. Yeah, it's really, really cool. And finally, um, it's being Sophia is being used today, actually in 2018 and in, into 2019, to look closely at star formation, celestial bodies, and the brightest comet we observed in 2018. And I'll give you this awesome example. This picture right here was taken from Hubble, and this is and I forget the name of the comet, but you know they name it a bunch of letters and numbers. Um, this was the brightest comet in the night sky during 2018, and this was from the Hubble telescope in space. This is the picture that Sophia took of the same thing. Oh. So we actually can see it a little bit clearer, a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's just absolutely incredible. And I never knew it even existed. It's been flying up there for years. <laughs> That's crazy. It's man. so crazy. So thank you so much for sending that in. The other topic that we have this week, we're going back to Mars because some really, really cool stuff we found from Mars, and this isn't from InSight. This is actually from the ESA Mars's Express Orbiter. It spotted water ice-filled crater, and this Whoa. is the actual picture. New images from the high-resolution stereo camera on the ESA Mars Express spacecraft show an impact crater in the northern lowlands of Mars. It's wow. known as the Korolev Crater. It's a 51-mile-wide crater filled with water ice all year round. This is named for Ser Sergei Korolev, who is considered the father of Soviet space technology. So that's a fucking lake. Basically. Basically, wow! this ever icy presence is due to the interesting phenomenon known as cold trap, which occurs just like the name suggests. The, the, the cold is trapped there. So therefore, it is water ice all year round. And if you go back to episode 62 when we had 
Dr. Michio Kaku on the show. He was right. talking about how if we can find large deposits like this on Mars, this would be the first areas of de- basically to look at mining water right, right. when we start to build colonies the, there. Uh, you know, the thing that blows my where is that water coming from? The, the universe. The universe is filled with water. In fact, e- like the the amount of water that we're finding just in the asteroid belt it was, is very surprising to us. And it's just water vapor, water drop, you know, like wow. so like there it is there. It just doesn't collect on a planet like Earth because not any of these planets have atmosphere. Like right, Earth. It right. gets trapped in our atmosphere and gets collected there. So it's just water on the surface. Right. Huh. Is that is that a picture of it? We can see it just like that. That yes, this wow. is that is a, that is a picture of Mars, but it is an artist representation of the ESA spacecraft. Right, there. right, right. right. Um, uh, the Mars Express mission members explained Korolev crater's floor is deep, lying 1.2 miles vertically beneath its rim. Its very deepest parts, those containing ice, act as a natural cold trap. The air moving over the deposit of ice cools down and sinks, creating a layer of cool air as it huh. sits directly above the ice itself. Um, and that's what's really cool about this. And to not only make this even more interesting, the ESA spacecraft first entered orbit around Mars on Christmas Day, 2003. Oh, and it's been there 15 years. 15th anniversary it found this discovery. Wow. Yes, because just before Christmas, it took these photos. That's insane. Yeah, really, really, really I have cool. a serious question for you, though, okay. Jeff. If somebody bottled this up and gave it to you, would you drink it? No. No? No, because, I mean, what we don't know is we know what's it, what it's comprised of, which is water ice. We know that. But it could have, like, methane. We don't know what else is it. I mean, we're starting to figure that out, but it won't be until we actually have a probe to literally probe it and figure out what— Scoop it out and send it? So who knows what could be I mean, we've got to be doing that, right? Or we got to be, like, aiming to do that. We're aiming to do that. We don't have any um, on-ground probe near the poles of Mars. Okay. But spacecraft like ESA does have— um, data collection that we can get some sort of idea of the other types of gases that are in this, okay, and mineral or or elements, I guess, yeah, that are yeah. that are in this. But it's still not going to be as conclusive as if we were to have something literally sticking something into it yeah. and checking it out. Well, you think we'd want to we'd want to send something and the the only thing is is I know the next probe that we're sending in 2020 we're not sending to the poles again we're sending a near the equator just because there's so much we don't know about the planet itself and even though this is water ice if we were to land we're not going to want to land near the poles we're going to want to land near the 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 middle of the planet because it's going to be a lot easier to land so that's kind of why we're sending the rovers where we're sending them is to really map out where's going to be the best place to do it and then we're going to figure out how to get from point a to point b and if you've seen any of the science fiction movies out there including that incredible show mars so good um uh, you know, that's what they're doing on those yeah. shows is like they have they're there in a colony and then they also have their rovers that they can figure out, OK, I have this amount of gas that can get me this far in a day. And then once it gets night, I have to camp and then I can come back. And it's like, so how can I get, you know, farther and farther distances? And those will be problems that huh. we'll have to face when we get there. So wild. So, so wild. It's the frontier, man. It really is. It's the frontier.